And we'll be continuing the thought that we uh, started last week on holy war. You know, it's... Um, I haven't got to study like I wanted to, <clears throat> but I've got to study and I've been, I guess, more in, um, in prayer, which is, uh, I think, needful sometimes. I don't know about you, but there's times when I can see in my life, there's seasons where I'm reading a lot. I can't get enough of the Word. And then there's other times that I seem to be praying, not neglecting the Word, but I'm, more emphasis, more of my time, more of my efforts is in prayer. And I see that in Yeshua. I see that in some of the men that we read in Scripture. And so I've been in that it's kind of season where I've been able to pray a little more than really be in the Word, except for today. I've got the Lord has let me allowed me into the Word. But so I want to continue the thought that I started last week, which was on holy war. And um, you know, we talked about David, how this young man who was anointed king was tending to some sheep. Israel goes out to battle to fight, and um, they're down there for a, quite a while, and Jesse sends the youngest of his sons, seven sons, down to check and see how the war is going and see how his brothers are faring. So he takes some cheeses and some things down, and he runs down to see his brother, and the Bible says that David shouted for the battle. And his brother, his oldest brother, Eliab, said, Listen, I know the naughtiness of your heart. I know why you've come down here just to see the battle. And so last week, we looked at what it means to, be, to have this holy war. What is war? What is this holy war all about? And so I want to pick up in the next chapter, chapter number 18. And I want to continue on in the thought. Now, chapter 18 is right after chapter number 17, which is what? Where David and Goliath fight. David kills Goliath with a sling and a stone. He runs upon him, didn't even have a sword, draws Goliath's sword, cuts his head off. Now all of Israel is out of their trenches and they have zeal to fight the battle of the Lord. And so this week as I continued reading, I don't know about you, but I tell you what, there's a lot of, I almost felt bad because I thought so highly of David. I almost thought I loved him more than I did Yeshua, you know, because I'm looking at David and he inspires me so much. I see a man who's after God's own heart. I see a man that is so tender, but yet he can be absolutely stern with the things of God when need to be. And he doesn't falter between them. I mean, somebody can raise up against even his enemy, King Saul, and said, I'm the one that took his life. And he said, by your own tongue, you'll die today. But yet whenever Saul dies, who tried to kill him, he walks around mourning and crying before the Lord. And I thought, how much of a right spirit is in this man, David? So we're going to read, I'll read the whole chapter, that's usually my habit, so we can get an understanding, and then we'll take it from there. It came to pass, verse uh, 1 of chapter number 18 of 1 Samuel. How many of you got your Bible this morning? I know we usually throw it up on the screen. That's slim pickings this morning, ain't it? You're going to have to listen to me. And it came to pass when he had finished speaking to Saul, the son of Jonathan was joined or stirred with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as he did his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. And Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped off the robe that was upon him and he gave it to David and his apparel, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Can you see that? Here's a man coming from nowhere and the king's son strips him all of his royal garments, even his garments of war, even his weapons, and gives them to David. You know what he's saying? I see that what you've got is what we need. And he gives all that he has into the hands of David. And David went out wherever Saul had sent him, verse 5, behaving himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came in when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and with songs of joy and instruments of music. And the women answered as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry and said, These things, and, and, and this 
thing was evil in his eyes, and he said, They have given to David or ascribed to David ten thousand, and to me they have only given thousands. What more can be done and given to him except the kingdom? And so I, David, from that day forward. And it came to pass on the next day that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and a spear was in Saul's hand. And Saul threw the, <clears throat> threw the spear, for he said, I will strike David even to the wall. And David drew back out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. And Saul moved him away from himself and made him his commander over a thousand. And he went out and he came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all of his ways and the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had behaved himself very wisely, he was more afraid of him. But all of Israel and all of Judah loved David because he went out and he came in before them. And Saul said to David, Behold, I will give you my older daughter Mirab for a wife. Only you be brave, only be brave son for me and fight the Lord's battles. But Saul thought, Let not my hand be upon him, <clears throat> but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. And David said to Saul, Who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? And it came to pass at that time that Mirab Saul's daughter should have been given to David. She was given to Adriel the Meholite to be his wife. And Saul's daughter Michal loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give her to him so that she may be a trap to him, so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. And Saul said to David, A second time, today you will be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, Talk with David secretly and say, Behold, the king delights in you, and all of his servants love you, and now be the king's son-in-law. And David's servants spoke these words in his ears of David, and David said, Is it a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and of little worth? And the servants of Saul told him this thing. Then it was the way David spoke and said, And Saul said, You shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants was told David these words, it was right in the eyes of David to be the king's son-in-law. Now the days were not yet fulfilled. And David arose and he went forth, and he and his men, and they killed two hundred of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and gave them in full number to the king, so that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter Michal for a wife. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. And the rulers of the Philistines came out, and it came to pass as often as they came out, David acted more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was very precious. Three times in this chapter, there's a saying about David that keeps coming up. And it says right here that David behaved himself wisely. So that's what I want to speak about this morning. In this war, because you can see from the reading of Scripture, we're dealing with war, but we're also dealing with a man that behaved himself wisely, and then it got more wisely, and then it got more wisely. Now can you imagine King David being a nobody? Not even thought enough of to be brought up before Samuel for the anointing of the king whenever all the other sons got up because David was out tending the sheep, but David's brought up. We know the story. The horn of oil is poured upon David. They anoint him king in Israel. David goes back to tending the sheep. Fights the bear, fights the lion. In process of time, David's standing there and he comes down to the, to the battle like we looked at last week. He shouts for the battle. He goes out and fights Goliath, but he doesn't fight with the armor of Saul. He fights with what he was used to and what he had proved. And the giant falls, he cuts his head off, he takes the head back to King Saul, and he says, Who are you? He said, I'm the son of Jesse. And the Bible says that he did not go home anymore after that. And God set him up and over all the men of war. 
So here is this young man, however old he is, I don't know exactly. They vary in opinion. But this man is brought from nothing all the way up to the, men, or the captain over all the men of war. And he begins to go out and fight the Lord's battles. And as he's going out and fighting, this is what happens. The women begin to get together and sing. Saul has slain thousands. But David, he's slain ten thousands. And when Saul heard this, it grieved his heart. And what did he do? He demoted David from the captain of all the men down to a captain of a thousand. In the sight of all the people. But the Bible says David behaved himself wisely. And he begins to go in and out in front of the people. And Saul begins to hate David. And the evil spirit comes upon Saul. And Saul even tries to kill David and he flees. And you'll find David again acting more wisely as time goes on. So this morning as we've been talking about holy war, I thought it would be wise for us to behave ourselves wisely. You know, when you're in a time of war, you, there's certain things you just don't get entangled with. There's certain things you don't put before you. There's certain things you don't do. There's certain places you don't go. And if you do, there's always recompenses for those things. But I begin to study this morning, what does it mean in Scripture to behave himself wisely? The word in Hebrew means to be prudent or to be circumspect. What's interesting to me is the first time that's mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3 when Satan comes to Eve and says that tree will make you prudent. It'll make you circumspect. It'll be, give you wisdom. And when she looked at the tree, what did she say? It's a beautiful tree. It will make me wise. And she took and she did eat. And we know that what happened. It wasn't wisdom that she got, but the fall of mankind started went into Adam, and all the man race fell into this place called sin, of which we need a Savior. But the next time it's used is in Genesis 48. Israel stretched out his hands. Remember when he crossed his hands, and he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, but he blessed the, elder, or the younger with the right hand and the one that was older with the left hand? But the Bible says he guided his hands circumspectly. he done it with prudence. he done it with wisdom. So even though he couldn't see very good and Joseph done the best he could as ushering the children before him, because God had told him, he crosses his arms, lays the hands on the children and blesses them. That's the idea of the word to be prudent, to behave yourself wisely and or to be circumspect. And there's a lot of verses. I mean, the more I started to dig, the more verses come up. And I want to share a few with you, then I'll try to preach what's on my heart. In 1 Chronicles 28, 19, it says this, And you, now let me back up. This is David wanting to build the temple for God. God telling him, you can't build the temple, but I'll let your son build the temple. And you, laying not, or the Lord make to understand, the word understanding is prudence, in writing by his hand upon me, even all the work of this pattern. So when David sat down and he drew out the temple and he drew out the measurements and he began to gather the cedar and the gold and the silver, he gathered all those things together. The Bible said he done it with prudence. So even the drawing of it out, even the pattern, David says, was by prudence. Psalms 14, 2 says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did have prudence or understanding and seek after God. Amen. Think about that. Think about David and think about God. God looks down to see if there was any man that would act wisely, behave himself wisely. God's looking down. And so the Bible tells me that he did. He looked down one day and he found David, a man after his own heart. And God, if you'll keep on reading the book of Psalms and Proverbs, you'll find that a man who delights himself in the Lord, who's wise, God promotes to honor. Just like he did King David. Amen? Amen? So I want to talk to you this morning. Let me get one more verse. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And that was Isaiah speaking about the Messiah. So what does that mean for us? How do we apply that 
to this generation and to our walk and our life and even more importantly to the service that we've had this morning. It's interesting that we're dealing with repentance in the service, confession of sin, issues with our life, our behavior, our walk, our talk. And God gave me this and I wrestled with it. You know, I'm not sure if, you know, acting wisely or behaving ourselves wisely was the message. But the more I stayed in the service this morning, the more I listened to what people were dealing with and talking about, the more confidence it gave me that truly this is part of war. Because to be wise could cost us everything if we're not wise. Amen. In, a, in war, if you're not wise, if you don't keep your head down, you're going to lose your head. Amen. That's the truth because it's wartime. It's fighting. It's not time of anything else. So we have to be almost like blinders on the fact that this is war. This is fight. This is a time to be focused and dedicated. So I begin to wrestle with the Lord. I begin to ask him and he directed me to Ephesians chapter number five. So that's where we're going to go. And we're going to take our time this morning. And I'm going to, I've got much reading. And it's good. Amen. The reading of the Word of God is good. Ephesians chapter number 5. We'll just probably end up reading most of the chapter. Because it's interesting what happens in chapter 6 of Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we're not fighting. The war that we fight is not against flesh and blood, but against what? principalities, powers, all these things, evil and wickedness in high places. But I want you to listen. The Apostle Paul is dealing with us and he tells us to run our race. He tells us that we're like a wrestler, a fighter. We're like a warrior. He uses all these pictures, all these symbols to talk about the Christian life and what we are and what we ought to be doing. Verse 1 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior or aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as it is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not convenient or fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Do not, let, do not let anyone deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Now, I want to go back and break some of these words down. And I want us to sit a little while and let the Word of God just kind of soak in. Chapter or verse number three says this fornication, and that is any form of sex. That's homosexuality, lesbianism, men with animals, or men that are outside the covenant of marriage, or committing adultery. That takes in the whole ballgame, okay? When Paul is speaking about fornication, he's dealing with every kind of sexual sin. And who's he talking to? The church. Amen. That's who he's talking to. So he goes on to see uncleanness. That is any physical or moral defilement. That could be, you know, a, a lustfulness in any form and fashion. Foolish talking. That means to speak foolishly. Buffoonery. I never knew what that was. But you know what that means? It's ridiculous, but it's amusing. And I thought, how loose we are with our tongue. Amen. How loose we are. We will, we will speak blessing and curses out of the same mouth. Yes. I mean, if it's ridiculous, but yet we still got this laugh that we have to throw in there that kind of breaks the ice unless somebody's going to feel uncomfortable when we know we ought not say it and as soon as we said it and let it out of our mouth we knew it was wrong and we don't want to go through the fact of saying well I shouldn't have said that please forgive me but yet that's what it means so the apostle Paul when he's dealing with if you look at the last few verses of chapter 4 it says do not grieve the spirit don't quench the spirit so I'm dealing this morning with what? Our behavior. Our behavior. David waxed and grew wise in his behavior. 
Even when Saul tried to kill him, he didn't speak against him. When he was demoted in public, he didn't speak out. When he was brought down from being captain over all the men of war, and when he walked in, all the men that had been there for 10, 20, 30, and 40 years, they had seen hard war. They looked at David and they gave him respect and they gave him honor and he walked through there. And all of a sudden Saul comes in one day and says, Listen, you can't be a men of war no more. I want you to be the captain over this thousand of people and demotes him back down and puts somebody else in his place. And David goes out and he behaves himself wisely. You know what he says? Bless you, King Saul. You're right. That's where I need to be. Thank you for letting me be ruler over the men of war for this season. Thank you for placing me over these men. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. So David somehow was able to act wise in all that he done, which baffles me because sometimes when we are demoted, we want to speak out against it. When we are ridiculed, we want to lash back. And for the first time in this week, I was talking to Sister... Uh, Deronda and Brother Ron, and she, they were talking about things, and we were talking about backbiting. And for the first time in all of my life, I figured out what backbiting was. We always think it's about talking behind somebody's back. But listen, to bite back. And this big light bulb goes, ting! You know, somebody bites us, and we turn around and bite them back. And I never saw that. I always... Thought it was just talking about somebody behind their back, but yet when I got bit, what's the first thing you want to do? What did Mama tell you? If they bite you, bite them back. If they hit you, hit them back, right? That's what we're taught. But yet that's not what the Spirit of God teaches. When He was suffering, Jesus Christ threatened not. When He was rebuked, He suffered it. When He was spit upon, He took it. Amen? Can you imagine that? I remember one time we were at the nursing home and me and my wife, we were going in the Alzheimer's ward and that was my first, you know, that's where I started preaching. If you want to know, it was the Alzheimer's ward. That's where I started. I went down at nine o'clock in the morning. I stood before a bunch of people and I'm preaching. And even the one of the Alzheimer's looks says, what are you doing here? They don't understand you. I said, they do understand me. So we're going around, we're shaking hands, you know, we're trying to do the best we can do. And this woman gathers all the spit she can and spits in my wife's face and says, you took my husband. And the spit running off her face, she takes and wipes it off and it smelled like throw up. And she wipes it off her face and smiles at her. They spit in David's face. You know what he said? Remember when the man was cussing David? You want me to go over and kill him, David? No. No. The Lord has bidden him to do this. He looked at everything in a different set of lenses than I think we do in the majority. When we suffer, we want to let others suffer with us. We want to share our shame. We want to speak our filth. We want to demote them because we've been demoted. We want to bring people into our misery and our muck. And we don't understand we're making that pile a lot bigger and we're getting others called in it and it's not changing anything. And our behavior before people is being marred. And our name is being marked. You ever seen a man who's a preacher or something do something that's off color and all of a sudden you mark that man? His behavior is less than what it should be. And I'll tell you this, the lost community, they know exactly how a man of God should walk. They do know that, and they look for that. And the first time they see a man stumble, that'll be the reason they don't come to church. That'll be the reason they don't pray. That'll be the reason they don't read their Bible. Because that man's behavior didn't grow wiser. Maybe it was a weakness like David had a time or two. But what the idea I'm trying to get across to us, myself, this morning, is that in this fight of holy war, we have got to live wisely before people. Our behavior, the way we act, the way we personify ourselves, has to be that which professes holiness and faith and trust. And I think that's the greatest breach in our life is our conduct. How many epistles did the Apostle Paul write and deal with men and their conduct and their issues? It goes on to say, filthiness. 
which is shamefulness or obscenity. Foolish talking or jesting. You know what jesting is? I didn't understand jesting. It, de it deals with the idea of our wit. And it means to turn easy. So jesting in, in, in King James or New King James is the idea of, of being quick with a reply that's kind of, you know, light and quick with a reply that's kind of, you know, that's sparing. And so we're so quick, somebody will say something and we can be right on top and spin it right back around and point it right back at them. That's the idea of jesting. And I know that the man of God that I said under, that was one thing he didn't allow. And that was when, you know, getting into a habit of jesting and joking. I know that we like to laugh, but I'll be honest with you. We have crossed the line in that area a thousand steps over. We don't know how sometimes to hold a holy conversation and not cross the line where we got to be joking and jesting and, and bring our behavior before people and make ourselves lower than what God is calling us to be. And our behavior ought to be that which people look at and say, whatever that is, I need it, I want it, and I've got to get it. But yet what we do is we say, if he's a Christian, I guess I'm just okay because his life looks like this. And in some places I'm better than that. I don't have to fear that man's God. But when David walked before him, they recognized him. And the Bible says that what they do, they begin to love David. David was walking in and out in front of all these men, men of war, younger, older, the king himself. And they're watching David's character. And they're watching his reactions. They're watching him go out to fight. They're watching him in war. They're watching him when he goes home. They're watching him whenever something arises. And they keep watching his character. And his character is spotless. And he grows in wisdom. And he grows in knowledge. And he grows in understanding. And he behaves himself wise. Ephesians goes on to say, it's not convenient. Which means it's not proper. This is not the place that you want to attain to. I guess it's very fitting that James would really stick us with our tongue. I guess if I, Tommy Campbell, offend anywhere greater than anything in my life, I guess, I believe, and I probably got about eight or ten witnesses at home, it's my tongue. It's my tongue. It's my, it's the breaches in my behavior. It's my you know, and some of it, we could blame this or blame that. But in all reality, if we're a child of God, the Bible says we don't need anybody to teach us. For that same Spirit teaches us all things. But what happens is we don't obey. We don't obey. We want to laugh. We want to joke. We want to bring up the remembrance of certain things. I was reminded, as I said yesterday with uh, Brother Ken and, and um, Brother Jeff and Richard, and I began to... We, we begin to talk about some things that I'd done a long time ago and I was convicted. I thought, I better shut my mouth. I had a thousand stories that begin to come. And I could have told all, you know, all these stories about when I was a lost man, but the Bible says those things are shame. That you shouldn't even speak of them. You shouldn't talk about them. And I wasn't trying to give uh, the devil any credit or my life any credit. I was trying to honor God. And, but at the same time, I see that my behavior and my conversation is not where it should be. And I thought, God, this is me. And so I want to call us up to a, a, a level in our behavior before men in our pursuit of this war. Because if we want to be used and usable, we know our tongue has got to be tamed. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly beast set on fire of hell. And it sits on fire the course of what? Nature. And it's set on fire of hell by itself, right? No man can tame the tongue. But thank God, God can. Amen. It goes on to say, neither whoremongers. You know, whoremonger is a male prostitute. And so I just want to read on some more because we're dealing with war. 
And it's amazing, whenever I've went over to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and I begin to read 5 and go into 6, I thought how it was that God could take that kind of thought that God gave me and tie Samuel and Ephesians together dealing with behavior. Verse number 8 of Ephesians 5 says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, it's in righteousness, and it's in truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove or expose them. For it, is, uh, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by light. For whatsoever makes manifest is the light. Therefore, he says, Awake you that sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, prudently, wisely, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now here we go. Here it gets good. It gets even better, don't it? Paul dealing with our behavior, right? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, also as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as Christ, or just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought. You know what that word, everybody's a husband, look at it. You know what that word ought means? You're under obligation. That's what that means. You're under the obligation to what? Love your wives as your own body. He that loves his wife loves his flesh, right? For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects or reverence her husband's children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may be well with you all the days, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training or the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to those that are masters according to the flesh, and fear, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as unto the Messiah, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bondservants of the Messiah, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service, as to the Lord, and not to men." Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether it be a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And right before he gets into what we put on, does that not fit very much with what David was going through? All these things that you can say were being said of David. He's supposed to marry a woman. Guess what happens? She's given to somebody else to marry. Now, how angry could you be? Well, let's go back in Genesis and see just how angry somebody was whenever somebody slipped in another woman when he was supposed to marry somebody else. He didn't think too kindly of that, did he? He goes up and says, what have you done to me? It's, it's, against, the, it's against the Torah to give you the second born instead of the first born. 
Abide with me. But David was so wise in his character, I don't, rec- I don't see recorded where he ever made an accusation against King, King Saul. I don't see ever recorded where he threw down his sword and said, I'm done with this, 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 this regiment that I'm in and this few men that I'm over. When God told me I was going to be the king and I'd be in Saul's place, but yet Saul's still there. Not only is he still there, now he's persecuting my life and trying to slay me. He's given me the second born. And I don't understand this. You may know, but Saul said this woman that he marries will be a snare to him and the Philistines will get something over on him. So I don't know what was wrong with her or how this would play in, but somehow with Michal being married to David, it wasn't a good thing. It was an occasion for David to get snared. And you know what David says? You think it's a light thing to become the son's king or the the king's son-in-law? You think I take this lightly? To be part of the king's family? To be free in Israel? To have lineage to the throne? You think I take this lightly? So they go back and say, listen Saul, he ain't mad. He's happy. He's glad about this. Well, you tell him, I don't want no dowry. I just want a hundred foreskins. You know what David gets? Two hundred. Brings them in full tail and gives them to the king. The king gives him his, his daughter to marry. And guess what happens? Now David is part of the family. And he behaves himself more wisely. And so as I read, you know, I read uh, Samuel, then I begin to read some of the Psalms and I'm just taken up with the character of King David. And I wonder, what made David, David different? Why is it that God used David? You know what David said? I meditate in your law and I'm more wiser than all the others, even the ancients. Because I meditate in your word. David gave himself to the word of God. He let thus saith the word of God be his yes and his no. It didn't matter what the group was doing. It didn't matter what the world was doing. It didn't matter what the church was doing. David's eyes were focused on God himself. And if God said no, David said no. And if God said yes, David said yes. Matter of fact, David would go and inquire of the Lord. You remember the story after this? After Saul tries to kill David and David flees and he's hiding out in the field. And Jonathan says, listen, my father loves you. He said, listen, your father wants to kill me. He said, I tell you what, there's going to be a new moon service coming up. And it never fails. I'm supposed to be at the king's table. But you tell him I've got some business to do down in Bethlehem. I've got a sacrifice to be at. And if he's angry, you'll know he wants to kill me. And if not, then it'll be told. He said, sounds good. How will I know? He said, I'll shoot an arrow, and if it goes behind you, I'll send out a lad and say, go on past, keep on going. And so David's waiting out in the field. They go in, it's a new moon service, it's the second night. David wasn't there the first night, now it's the second night, and he's still not there. So Saul says, Jonathan, where is the son of Jesse? Oh, he asked, leave of me, father. He wanted to go down to, to, to his family and there have a yearly sacrifice. And Saul's anger rises up and said, Don't you understand? You will never be the king as long as that man is alive. And you are a son of a rebellious woman, is what he called his own son. So Jonathan gets up, he grabs his bow, he goes to the window and he shoots out his, or goes out in the field and he shoots his arrow. He sends the lad to go and David hears it. They run and they hug each other and David flees for his life because Saul wanted to take his life. Then you'll find David gathering. He goes down and he goes to the priest. Remember that? He goes to the priest and he says, Listen, I'm on a secret errand. Nobody knows I'm here but the king himself. And I need some bread. And I need a sword. He said, Why did you come alone? You're making me afraid, David. He said, It's such a secret business. Nobody's to know. Do you have any bread? He said, I don't have any common bread. All I have is this hallowed bread. And we're getting ready to take it off and put the fresh before there. If the men have have been holy, they can have it. And David said, the men have not been around a woman for three days. He said, then they may eat. Don't you have a sword? He said, we have uh, the one laid back here and it's wrapped up. It's the sword of Goliath. And David said, is there any sword like that? Give it to me. And he takes the sword and he takes the bread and he goes on down a little further and you'll find men that are distressed. Men that are in trouble, men that are in debt, 
they begin to gather towards David and he begins to be the captain over them. And David behaves himself more wisely. And so this morning, I wonder where our character is at. Because in all reality, that's the issue with me and with all of us. Those small breaches, those small defects. You know, we want to label everything some kind of disease, but if you'll just read the Bible, most of it's your flesh. <laughs> Outburst of anger, I just can't help it. I, 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 exactly, that's exactly right. Your heart is out of control and you blurt out things. The Bible says that's your flesh. Amen. Well, I've got a problem. You do. Your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above everything. <laughs> Only God can know it. Amen. That's the truth. So we need to get back to Scripture. Amen? Amen. What does thus say the Word of God? Why is it that we'll take everybody else's advice instead of saying, Well, Lord, you said this. And like the apostles did, this is a hard saying, Lord. How can I eat your flesh and drink your blood? I don't understand this. You're scaring me this morning, Lord. He said, don't you know my words are spirit and they are life. Amen. So the word of God is what? Life. So I thought about our character. I thought about our behavior before others. And I thought as we fight this battle, you know, there's... Have you ever been sent to maybe witness to somebody or talk to somebody or go to somebody? And um, as the old preachers say, you let your slips show. You mess up. You, there's a breach in your character. And then you go back and you want to talk to that person and you see there's a wall up now. For whatever defect that happened, now there's more of an obstacle you've got to cross because of breach in character. And so as we're fighting this holy war, we have to be holy. We have to walk holy. We have to think holy. We have to talk holy. We have to become holy. Because the battle that we fight is not flesh and blood. You know, sometimes in our family, sometimes I'd like to bump heads real hard with John Paul. But my battle sometimes isn't John Paul. There's something influencing him and me. He pushes my button and I willingly push his because he's pushed mine. And then it's like, remember the movie Inside Out? How many of you have seen that? Remember the little, short, the little short red Baptist preacher that was in there with the tie? Anger, remember him? And he got to the last thing and he says, the foot is down, the foot is down. And he gets angry, right? And all of a sudden his top blows off and all this fire comes shooting out. I saw that and I thought, my God, <laughs> that guy, I know him very well. I've seen him before around. But that's our flesh. The Bible says outburst of anger is a work of the flesh. So whenever you feel that rising up in you, and you want to blurt out all these things, know that that's not the Spirit of God. God's not prompting you to do that. God's telling you to bridle your tongue, Amen. hold your peace, Amen. keep your composure. I mean, can you imagine having the ability to slay all men with your word and yet suffer all that Christ did? Amen. Knowing the hearts and the minds. When people would come to Him and say, Lord, should we give tribute to Caesar, you great master rabbi? And he could see their heart. And he loved them, the Bible says. And he says, show me a piece of money. Render the things that are Caesar's to Caesar and the things that be to God to God. How good of an answer is that? So I want to encourage us as we look at our, as our president and we look at our rulers, our mouth sometimes wants to speak, but I'll be honest with you. The scripture says no man can get up there except God put him there. Amen. 
So whether you like it or not, or I like it or not, it doesn't matter. I have not the authority to speak against what God has placed in order. Whether it's a for you know a whip and a chain to the nation, or whether it's for liberation, I don't know. But I know this. Paul says, and we're getting ready to read it. First thing, prayer and supplication should be made for all men and those in authority over us. Amen. That's the scripture. But what we want to do, well, he ain't doing like I think he ought to do. He lied. And there's times when we have to call things as they are, but there's also times that we have to slow ourselves down. Amen? Let's look in Titus chapter number 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2. Probably just start in verse 1. You know, God is... Um, He's teaching this young preacher how to ordain and put things in order. He's telling them or telling Titus how to ordain and, and to watch men and, and see if they're fit for the positions that they desire. Because the Bible says if you desire to be the bishop or the overseer or a preacher, you desire what? A good work. Therefore, if you desire that, you must be all these things. And no doubt there were people there that wanted to be that. And so Titus was sitting. And verse 1 of 2 says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and patience. The older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, but showing all good fidelity, and that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now listen to this verse. For the grace of God, salvation bringing. I want you to understand that. When salvation comes to your home, this is what it brings with it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to, to, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing in the great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify Himself, His own special people, zealous of good works. Speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. And so, as we go back over this, and I'll be done in a few minutes, I want to slow down and just take some of these words and break them down to where you and I understand these things. What does it mean to adorn something? If, if, if you adorn something, we used to do it a lot. But it means to put in order or to arrange. So, the writer, Apostle, the Apostle Paul says this, that we are to adorn these things. Women are to adorn. Men are to adorn certain things. And so he starts off by saying this. Look in the, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, love and patience. So let's take the men. 
The older men are to be sober. You know, some of the greatest faults, and I'm not blaming them because I'm my own man, but I saw the laxness. As a man, as a man that did not grow up in church at all, I had two vacation Bible schools experience till I was about 20, okay? So there's a basic brief background of who I am. So I didn't know nothing, okay? But when I look to the older men, sometimes their breach of character done more harm than it done good. Because they were one thing in the house of God and completely something else as soon as they got out the door. Amen? That's the truth. Their conversation on the front porch was everything but the things of God. They come in, they sing the praises, they shout, they run up and down the aisle. They go out and grab their cigarettes and they start talking the same stuff that they did when they walked back in the church. Like there's no break. Like there's no, you know, there's not this great... There's a great division like God is okay in here, but outside it's everything is goes. And, and I think God is doing away with that, especially in this fellowship, because we know that is not good. And that is not the way to be. God wants us the same here as He does on the job site, as He does at the grocery store, and especially in our own home. God wants an even kill of a man and a woman. To be holy there, to be holy here. Amen. To be holy at the job site, to be holy on the altar. Amen. We are to be holy. And we've got a holy fight and a holy battle and a holy calling and a holy Savior and a holy God. And God continually comes to us and deals with our sins and our iniquities and says, Listen, be you holy, for I am holy. That's the first thing He ever told Abraham. Amen? Abraham, be holy. Because I'm holy. And so I want, us to be I want us to be exhorted to holiness. I think that's a lost art. There's a book that I read some time ago and it was a return to holiness. Returning to it. Because I think we forgot it. And guess what? You know, I was, I, I'm not, I'm like in the, I guess in the middle ground. I'm not old, but I'm not young, you know. But the older men are to do what? To teach the younger men. Somebody come to me with a question. You know what I told them? I said, you ought to go ask Brother Ken about that. He would be perfect for that. He knows that. He's got wisdom there. He's got experience there. I said, when I have troubles in that area, I go ask Ken because I don't have all the answers. Amen. I hope I can help you and have some of those answers. But the older men are to teach young men. And sometimes that's like, come here, brother. You've done your best. Praise the Lord. Keep on trucking. Other times it's to say, listen, you ain't acting right. And we got a good pastor that does not bother to do that. Amen. Amen. Many times as he lovingly corrected me and helped me. But you know what? One thing about him, he asked for correction himself. I remember sitting at Heritage one day and I was um, I was studying. I had these like these little well, they're not there anymore. We had these big flags and I would take two flags and mark me off a corner in the sanctuary. And I'm in there freezing to death. And Matthew's in there with his shoes off and the heater blowing and studying, you know. And uh, so we would pray. We'd meet for prayer. And uh, I came in one day and he said, are you in sin? I said, uh, I said, I, I've got issues, man. He said, no, no, no. He said, I ain't talking about like, I, he said, I'm talking about open sin. You, he said, you watching pornography? You doing any of these things? I said, no, no. And so there's like a dead silence for a minute. He's like, ain't you going to ask me? I said, are you in sin? He said, no. He said, we got to keep ourselves accountable. I said, you're right. And that's what we try to do. Amen. Me and Brother Ken and Brother Matthew and Brother Richard, we try to hold each other accountable. But you know what? Just like the other day, we were sitting and, and, uh, and I had to confess, that we're working, uh, Brother Matthew's building the deck, me and Jeff and Steve and Richard and Ken, and we're sitting there and on Wednesdays, the elders don't eat, right? So I'm sitting there and and um, she's like, I got you guys some lunch. And Jeff's like, all right, praise the Lord. So I'm thinking, Jeff must be eating today. So now I'm thinking, well, maybe it's okay because I don't want to offend Jessica. She's made this food and man, it looks awful good. And I'm hungry. And so I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for this light to ding on Jeff. And I'm, I'm wrestling myself, you know, I'm wrestling with eating. And he's like, you want to pray? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'll pray. So we pray and, and he starts eating and I start eating and we get about two thirds of the way and Jeff goes like this. 
And I thought, man, he's bit down on something and hurt his tooth. He said, I completely forgot that we fast today. I said, well, to be honest, I said, I guess I'm in more trouble. I said, because I knew and you was eating, so I thought it was okay for me to eat. And so I said, now I'm wrestling whether to finish the rest of this or just stop right here. <laughs> and so he put the lid on his plate and I put the lid on my plate and we just sit there and looked at each other for a minute. But what would have happened if he would have said, no, 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 we, we agreed not to eat. Or what if I would have been, because he, he completely forgot it slipped his mind, but it didn't slip my mind. It, as, soon as, as soon as we prayed, it was like, so you're going to eat today? I'm thinking, I, I, have, I plan on it, Lord, I really do. And so I, Father, forgive me, I disobeyed. I disobeyed. And so older men are supposed to be wiser and more intelligent and have more experience, more faith. That's why they're called upon in the church to teach the younger. And sometimes we do that well. And sometimes some of the things we teach are not so good. Amen. I remember being out to eat with one of this. He was a pastor of mine at one time. And this man, uh, there was a group of us. And we're sitting there and, and um, you know, I'm... If you know me, I don't eat a whole lot. I used to. I used to eat as much as I could. And I, used to, I started, honestly, to put a picture of me up here so you could see that I'm not lying to you. But I didn't. But we're sitting there, and this man, he sits down, and he orders like the triple meat platter at, at a, a, a Cracker Barrel, and it's loaded up, and he's just, he eats every bite of it. And this one deacon says this. He said, I don't know whether to be proud of him or to be ashamed. And I thought, oh, my word. That's exactly right. You might have said, man, way to go. Praise the Lord, you eat every bit of that. Or you might have backed up and said, man, you got, you got an issue. But the older are supposed to what? Teach the younger. So I know God is calling us to that. It goes on to say to be sober, to be reverent, to be temperate, to be sound in the faith, in love, to be sound. In patience, to be sound. You ever took a hammer and hit an anvil? Hear the solidness? It's sound. It's tried. It's true. We were working on Matthew's deck and there's a chimney right there and I went to drive a nail and that thing must have been hollow because it just sounded hollow. You couldn't drive a nail. It was bouncing. And that's not sound. Something sound is when, you know... It's solid. It's strong. It's stout. Men of God, older men especially, you're to be strong. You're to be stout in faith. Stout in love. Stout in prudence. All these things we as men are to be stout. That way when new believers and young believers come in, they can go to us and in all reality we can instruct them in the way that's right. That's what God wants out of what? The body. It goes on to say, verse number three, the older women, the same thing, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So now God le or Paul leaves men and he goes to the women. And this is what he says. Let the older women likewise be reverent in their behavior. Remember when Sarah called her husband what? Lord. And God said... This was right. This was good. This was actually a beauty mark to Sarah for doing that. God said it was good. Not that He's always in charge and definitely because not He's always right, but because her eyes are not only on her husband, but they're on the Lord and she wants the blessing from God just like the man wants the blessing from God. So her eyes are to God. And so she honors her husband as a woman honors God. Amen? Reverend in behavior, not a slanderer, not talking behind, 
not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish. There's that word to adorn. That they may adorn, that they may arrange the young women to love their, to love their husbands, to love their children. You know, um, the Bible declares that uh, in the last days, something would happen to men and women. That they would be without natural affection. And that means to be without motherly, fatherly love. I heard just this week some stories that you know, I, I'm a parent and I know how um, easy it is to lose your temper and all those things. But these children were kept in garbage bags, chained up, fed dog food. How can you have the love of God and do that? It's impossible. You can't. That's that's the fruit of a godless society or a godless person. So Paul says in the end, men would be without motherly, fatherly love. You know what? They're not daddies. You want to see some come down to the bus. You'll see men with all kinds of children in all kinds of places and they don't, can't figure out why they're on the streets and God doesn't seem to like them very much. And you see women just this week that had a baby seven days ago and she's back on the street and DCHS has got her children. And I'm thinking, what is going on? But I'll tell you what it is. There's a spirit that breathes down people's neck and steals from them motherly, fatherly love to where you actually have regard and concern for their own little children and those in your family. And that's what the apostle is dealing with. That the older women would teach younger women. Why? Maybe because they've been married for a long time and they've had ups and downs and ins and outs and all these things. And they can with wisdom and with grace say, listen, it ain't always good and it ain't always right. And you would always do right and he don't always do right. But this is what I found to be true. This is what's tried. And I'll give you my advice. And if you take it, God will bless you like he did me and bring me out of the situation that I was in. We were talking about that just the other day. But you older women, you're to teach the younger. And I'll be honest with you. Younger women are looking for a teacher to stand up. Younger women in this generation, the reason they're doing the things they're doing is because nobody's teaching them what is right and what is wrong. It's not there. There's a defect. There's a breaking down. There's, there's, a, there's a lack or a lasp in a generation that has where families gathered around the table and they ate and they done things together to this generation where somebody's eating in the room, somebody's outside, they're going every which way. And to gather them up, there seems to be like this great upheaval of everything to get everybody together just to bring them together. And nobody's teaching by example. Matter of fact, we know it's right sometimes and we try to teach, but it's not by example, you know. We know it, we see it, we want it fixed. And by the grace of God, we roll our sleeves up and we hammer it out. And sometimes we don't do as much good as we think. So, in verse number 3, The older women likewise be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given too much wine. <coughs> teachers of good things, that they may adorn or admonish the younger women to love their, or love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good and obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So what is the reason that Paul finishes up his argument with the women? That the word of God not be blasphemed. You know, and I can only preach from example and from what's going on in my house and all that. So if that bothers you, I'm sorry, but that's all I know how to do. You know, right now there is a battle over dress code 
in our family. There is. I had it with Lexi and Tier, but now they've kind of got out of the house. And so now, one of my daughters, I won't say, but, um, is extremely beautiful to me. They're all beautiful to me. Every one of them. But there's one, or there's two daughters right now that have left our home and they've got their own families. And now I have a set, another two that are leaving childhood and going into teenage and becoming young women. Their bodies is beginning to change in fashion. They are leaving a little girl and coming into a woman. And so now I'm having to say, you can't wear that. You can't, you can't go out of the house with that on. You, you can't do that. You, you, don't you understand that you are beautiful and God has fashioned you and you, nobody can see that but me and your husband. And there's a time when daddy stops seeing those things. When they're little and I'm giving them a bath and it's all fine and dandy. But there comes a time when that stopped, you know. I remember one time giving Lexi a bath and she was just a little bitty thing. I mean like this tall, you know. And I'm like running the water and I'm getting all this done. And she's standing there naked. And I'm just, you know, I'm looking at her and looking around. And she's like, okay. I'm thinking, you're three years old. She's like, you can leave now. I thought, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't thinking. So I get out of the bathroom, you know, and I shut the door and I hear her splashing around. Daddy, come drive me off. I'm thinking, I wasn't allowed in there just a few minutes ago. But I thought, you know, those hard conversations that we have to have. When you deal with teenagers and sex and the body changing and hormones and all those things that nobody likes to talk about. And so we don't talk about it. So then we got this mess that we have to try to fix later because nobody wants to talk about it now. And so what we need young men to be taught by is the older men. And we need older women to look at the younger women and say, no, this is right. This is how you dress. This is how you talk. This is how you walk. This is how you cook. This is how you clean. This is how you do all things that the Word of God not to be blasphemed. Amen. And it goes on to say what? That our prayers are not hindered. Because you know, if you and your spouse are not quite there, you can pray. But it's still there, right there on the ceiling where you left it. But how good it is to pray when you can, um, when you know that not, there's not all. I mean, there may be things you're working through, but the all is not there. And your behavior is holy. And so I spent last night talking to one of the daughters, or actually just talking to both of them, and trying to go about it a little different way and say, listen, a man told me this and he helped me. He said, younger ladies, I want you to view yourself and watch and look how you dress and watch yourself and see what men might think of you. Meaning this, when you look at yourself, is it revealing? If it is, profess holiness. Amen? I know it's hard. I know nobody likes it. But it's truth. Because in all, honestly, let's flip the table. A lot of men stumble because of the way women dress. They do. They stumble. A lot of men have fallen just with one glimpse. Speaking of which, the man King David. The man Solomon. Amen? So the shamefacedness, Paul says... And that means a sense of shame and a sense of honor. To be almost bashful or to regard and to respect others. And sobriety means soundness of mind and self-control. You know, I feel sad for this generation, especially for a lot of the younger ladies, because they have slim pickings on what kind of clothes they can get because they're all made a certain way. They're all tight. They're all revealing. Matter of fact, I know a Baptist preacher who's a real man of God that he quit wearing pants that were pleated in the front because homosexuals designed them. And as soon as he heard that, he cut them out of his closet. Because he was so focused on, I want to honor God. And you know, we, we, I think in our generation, we've cast that off. And there's a right place for this kind of discussion and the right place for dress code and all those things. Amen? Is anybody listening? I mean, is that the truth? It is the truth. 
And so David, you know, remember when he danced and, 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 and his, Michal said, you were naked before all the way. You ladies, you shamed yourself. And David said, I'll be even more vile in your sight. And he never knew her again from that time. She died without a child. And so in our battle, in this holy war, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And our behavior has gotten to the place, and I'm speaking about me, and I'm just about done. Our behavior has got to be changed. And the only thing that can change it is the Spirit of God, like we learned this morning. That's why I think it was so fitting what God laid on my heart. Not that I'm anything or I've got the download from everything. But I know this. God confirms what He wants done sometimes. Most of the time. And it's interesting that we're dealing with repentance. And you know when I came in here early this morning, that's what I did for the first little bit is repent. Digging around in my heart. Feeling like I'm here but nobody's here with me. And it took some time to work through confession and repentance and dealing with my heart and looking within. And like Austin said, and, and, and Sister Victoria and Brother Ken and others and Brother John and Matthew, they were talking these same things. And so I want to encourage you, if I can. I know it may not be much encouragement, but it will be if we put it into practice. Be holy. Be holy. Walk holy. Talk holy, dress holy, work holy, shop holy, pray holy, do everything holy. Holy is separate. It's separated. You know, sometimes I wonder what made Sarah and some of those, you know, patriarch women so highly exalted. You know what I believe some of it was? It was the glory of God on their countenance. I believe that. I've seen, I've seen people walk and see God's countenance on them and I think that's a beautiful person, whether man or woman, because the favor of God is in their life and they're walking at that time in holiness. And it's a beautiful thing. You know what happens? Usually if you see it, you go up to them and say, will you pray for me? I see you're in a place that I'm not. And I, I want to get there. And I want to have that. And so I want to encourage you this morning as we think about battling and about fighting and about holy war and all these things. Strive for holiness. Matter of fact, the Bible says without holiness, what? No man will see the Lord. Is it a wonder we're not seeing Him? Honestly. What about our personal life? Is it possible that men could actually with their physical eyes see the Lord? I believe it with all my heart. Nobody will change my opinion of that. I believe if a man gets holy and down to business with God and seeks Him with all of his heart, God will do things in and to and through that man that nobody would know. And he might not even be able or allowed to be telling anybody what God has shown him in secret. And I've heard stories. I heard of a man one time, this is what he said. He said, God, I want to be filled with your spirit and walk in your power. And this is what he said. He said, it was like as soon as I prayed that, God left me all to myself. He said, everything in my life fell apart. He said, I could go to church and preach and the Lord would bless. He said, but as soon as I got down out from behind the pulpit, he said, I was as dry and as cold. He said, my, everything was going haywire. He said, I walked out in the field one day and I said, God, I can't do this any longer. I can't do it anymore. And he said, you may believe me or not. He said, it don't matter. He said, there was a hand touched me. And he said, I looked back. He said, it was a nail scarred hand laid on my shoulder. He said, I cannot get men to come this way any longer. That's what I'm talking about. That is possible if we'll get right with God and we'll walk in holiness. I believe it. Do you believe it? I believe it. Say it. I believe it. I believe it. But we've got to get these guys and this and this and these in order that we might see the things that those men have saw. And it starts in our character. Why did David get all that he got? Why could God look at David and say, listen, if, if everything I gave you wasn't enough, if you would have asked me, I would have gave you such and such a thing more. If you had just asked me, David. Why? Because David had a heart for God. 
And he stumbled. You know what he did? Though the righteous fall seven times, yet he gets back up. Amen. Though he stumbles, God raises him back up. And his pursuit was God Himself. So I want to encourage you this morning. Take your eyes off me, please. Off Matthew, off Ken, off the vineyard, off church. Put your eyes on God. Follow Him. Look at Him. Read of Him. Let Him mold your character. Let Him change your thoughts. Let Him change your heart. And go out and behave yourself wisely. Have you ever done it? Last thing I want to say, have you ever done that and, and, and felt in yourself that you were glad that you behaved yourself wisely? Amen. I remember the first church I ever pastored and uh, I, I, was, I was at a business meeting and, or it was a meeting and I was behind the pulpit like this and it went south and it was like all of them had guns pointing at me and I never experienced the peace of God like I did that day. I mean, they were saying pretty rough things, and I was just smiling, looking at them. Anybody else? You got anything else to say? I get outside, my wife's about to explode. She sighs, and the whole suburban shakes. I'm going up the road, and I'm crying. But yet, in their presence, I had composure. I, it, I wasn't offended. I wasn't hurt. But when I got away from them, I could let my hair down to God and say, Oh God, this hurts. I didn't think Christians could be this way. I thought every man was a preacher. Every woman was a holy woman. And God gave me a little bit of experience that day. So I want to encourage you. Live holy. I know I keep saying it, but I'm going to hammer it in there until God says stop. Be holy. It's doable. The Bible says everything that we need has been given unto us to live a holy, godly life. Do you know that? Everything you need is done been paid and sent to you. It's yours. All you got to do is what? I know I keep saying I'm done, but I tell you, I don't like being done sometimes, you know? <laughs> One more story, amen? Remember Elijah in the cave? Old Jezebel's going to kill him after he killed all the prophets. He runs and flees. said, I'm the only one like me, Lord. He said, I've got 7,000 just like you, actually, that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. But I'll let you pity party there for a little while. And the storm comes and the fire comes and the earthquakes and God's voice was not in them. And then a still small voice came and he said, Lord, speak. And he wraps his, takes his mantle and wraps his face and he walks out. And he says the same story. I've been zealous for you. I just want you to kill me, Lord. I'm not even good as my father's. Just take me off the earth. And God encourages him. Amen. Amen. Get away. Listen for the still small voice. And I'll be obedient. Amen. Just like yesterday, I was so glad when I was obedient. I wanted to go home. But I drove downtown. And I drove around two or three times to where I could even find a parking spot because it's Friday evening. The bars are starting to fill up. People were walking around. But I was so thankful when I walked down there and I saw that man. I thought, praise the Lord. Amen. So I ask you as you pray, remember Brad Muncy, that God would save him, Amen. change his life, Amen. loose him from the addictions, and make him an example on the streets of the grace of God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, God, and we need you. Lord, your word is good. Your word is true. Your word is right. But God, we need help in the obedience of it and the walking out of it. Lord, teach us what it means to be the elder man. Teach us what it means to be the elder woman. And those that are here and, and they feel like there's a generational gap, Father, may they share from their experience. May they pour into the younger generation that which is right and holy and just and good. 
And may the younger generation be, have an open heart and a willing mind to listen and to obey. God, give us ears again to hear and give us a heart that's obedient. We ask, Father, in the name of Yeshua. Amen.